So today is Saturday, April 29th, 2017. Uh, today, uh, this is the day of the uh, People's Climate March and Rally. Uh, and so uh, I'd like to take a look at a particular koan in light of this. It really is a miracle uh, that it is spring once again. Only this spring, our environment of trees, air, water, animals, dirt, all of it, is threatened by a disastrous effort to roll back hard-won environmental protections which benefit all beings on the planet. This may open a sluice gate to irreversible decimation of the natural world, the world we grow out of, that we depend on and that sustains us. And that world includes all living beings, human, non-human, sentient, non-sentient, stones, water, and air, all alike. Such behavior is a terribly clear indicator of how separated, how lost from the reality of intimacy with all life so many human beings currently are. Regaining intimacy is not self-centered. It is one of the most important tasks for a truly human being. Intimacy, of course, is another name for realization or enlightenment. In light of this, with today's People's Climate Rally and March in Mind, and with it as a backdrop, bringing urgency to our Zen work of practice, realization of intimacy with all life, let's continue our exploration of Lao Tzu's The Sage is Not Human Hearted and Zen's teaching of the insentient by looking at an old koan, Zhao Chu's Oak Tree in the Front Garden. This is case uh, 37 of the Wu Men Kwan, or Mu Mon Kwan, the gateless barrier, uh, the oak tree in the front yard, or the oak tree in the front garden. The case. A monk asked Zhao Chu, what is the meaning of Bodhidharma's coming from the West? Zhao Chu said, the oak tree in the front yard. Wu Men's commentary, if you can see intimately into the essence of Zhao Chu's response, there is no Shakyamuni in the past and no Maitreya in the future. Wu Men's verse, words do not convey the fact. Phrases do not embody the spirit of the mind. Attached to words, your life is lost. Blocked by phrases, you are bewildered. Once again, we face, uh, we are face to face with that nagging question. Why did Bodhidharma come from the West? That is, what is the point of our Zen work and effort? Why did that old man over 1500 years ago take on the immense task of bringing Zen to China? Why did he make such work for himself and even risk his life in an advanced age when he should have been retiring and taking it easy? Instead, he went to China to start all over again in a new land, among new people, without any help. Some Buddhist teachers at that time hated Bodhidharma for being an upstart and for stealing their students and even tried to poison him and kill him. Why did he even try? What was so important? Academic Buddhism had already been in China for a couple of hundred years. There were devotional and meditative practices. There was sutra reading and commentary. What, not was, but is, the highest, deepest truth of the Buddha-dharma that Bodhidharma felt so deeply important he had to make it available at great personal risk. What is worth such toil, sacrifice, and struggle to realize? Why do we practice Zen today? What is not simply mindfulness, but intimacy or realization? Bodhidharma's main disciple, Wei Ke, you remember, stood in the snow through a bitterly cold night 
And then, legend says, even cut off his arm just to receive Bodhidharma's teaching and be intimate. In truth, that arm may have already been cut off by bandits prior to this, but that's how the legend goes. Weka himself was eventually killed by the governor of the province, who found his teaching, the teaching of Bodhidharma, so controversial, even antithetical to the state-sponsored program of fostering sutra study and the doing of good works to develop good karma and acceptance of a countless kalpa progressive path to Buddhahood. Here, too, what is this highest, deepest teaching that made it worth giving his all, even his life, for? Why was it seen so revolution as so revolutionary? Late in life, Weka, by then a noted master and a learned man, learned man, began hanging out in local taverns and markets. This surprised people. When he was asked why he, an enlightened sage, now did this instead of leading a reclusive life of teaching, is said to have answered, I do it for the sake of my own soul. Do you see what he was getting at? Is this what Chao Chu means when he answers the oak tree in the front garden? Is he saying that Bodhidharma came even for the sake of this ordinary old tree in the front yard? <clears throat> that he didn't see the tree as separate from himself. So being here for this tree was really being here for his own soul? Is his meaning, in short, that the highest teaching of the Buddha Dharma is boundless compassion for all things, even plants? Or might he mean even an oak tree is Buddha? Or even that all beings are Buddha? Even this tree? If so, if that's what you think, alas, you're already lost in the reeds and tall grasses. Let's look again. Bodhidharma, you may remember, was an Indian prince who, at an advanced age, is said to have made his way across the sea from southern China, southern India, rather, to China, around 400, maybe 500 A.D. A very difficult journey back then. This question of what was the meaning of his coming from the West would have been an intimate one for the Chinese Zen teachers who came after him. How did we get this great teaching and why? Why did Bodhidharma come here? It was not an abstract question, but specific for them. The West would also, for Chinese Buddhists at the time, have had tremendous spiritual resonance. First, India, the little, literal land to the west is the home of, of, of China, is the home of the Buddha. This Buddhist homeland was, for Chinese Buddhists, a holy land, like Israel for Jews, Christians, and Muslims today. But the west also suggests the western paradise of Amitabha Buddha, Buddha of boundless light. The question then also implies, why did Bodhidharma, who was seen as an emanation or manifestation of the Bodhisattva of compassion, of Alakitashvara, come all the way down from the lofty, serene, perfect Western paradise to this difficult earth, specifically to China, with all its difficulties? What did he bring? What was so important that he was motivated to make that journey? Case number one, Heki Gunroku, Bodhidharma's I don't know, goes like this. Emperor Wu of Liang asked the great master Bodhidharma, what is the first principle of the holy teaching? That is, what is the highest teaching of the Bodhidharma? Bodhidharma, same question. Bodhidharma said, emptiness without holiness. The emperor said, who is standing before me? In other words, aren't you a holy man? Bodhidharma replied, I don't know. The emperor did not understand. Thereupon, Bodhidharma crossed the Yangtze River and came to the kingdom of Wei. Later, the emperor brought this up to the prince Qi, who asked, does your majesty know who this man is? The emperor said, I don't know. Prince Qi said, he is the Bodhisattva of Alakitashvara, transmitting the Buddha mind seal. The emperor felt regretful. 
I wanted to send an emissary to invite Bodhidharma to return. Prince Chi told him, Your Majesty, it is no good sending a messenger to fetch him back. Even if everyone in the whole country were to go after him, he still would not return. What is the highest teaching? Shouldn't we know? Isn't this fundamental, not just to our practice, but to our life deep down? Don't we practice to know this? Not to simply be Buddhists, but to realize the meaning of our lives as human beings and attain the highest, most meaningful perspective on our all too brief time here. When asked by the emperor, someone well-versed in Buddhist doctrine, a founder of temples and supporter of thousands of monks and nuns, Bodhidharma said, vast emptiness, no holiness, and took all the emperor's own lofty preconceptions away, leaving him baffled. The great Zhao Chu, half a century later, said, the oak tree in the front garden. This too leaves many people baffled. How does speaking of a tree answer the question of the meaning of our lives and of Bodhidharma's difficult journey? By the way, this koan is sometimes translated as the cypress tree in the front garden. Regardless, it remains gnomic. Perhaps it is simply so clear we can't grasp it until we ourselves become clear. For knowing to be real, we ourselves must be real and capable of more than even a profound intellectual understanding. Chao Chu was one of the greatest of the Tong era Zen teachers, that golden age of Zen. He had his first deep realization at the age of 18. At 58, he had his profoundly complete Satori, a second most profound experience. He then traveled for another 30 years, checking himself and his evolving understanding against all the greatest teachers of his time, as well as against enlightened monks, laymen, and women. At the age of 80, he finally settled down and first began teaching. He taught until his death at the age of 120. The expression that other great teachers used when talking about Chao Chu was that his lips flashed light. He did not use the stick or the shout. His revelatory words were so subtle they came in beneath the radar, so ordinary, so integrated into the ordinary moments of a life, you'd hardly know he'd already laid it all down and moved on before you could even tell what had happened. The koan mu is from Zhao Chu, as is washer bowls. A monk came to the monastery and meeting the teacher said, I'm new here. Zhao Chu said, have you eaten your rice? I have, said the monk. Wash your bowl, said Zhao Chu. That's case number seven, Umen Kwan. I think of Aiken Roshi as the Zhao Chu of our time. He was quiet and subtle. Dogen, who is very sparing in his praise of even the great old teachers spoke in awe of Zhao Chu, simply calling him the old Buddha or the ancient Buddha. This is very high praise from him. Zhao Chu's humility for all his tremendous skill, understanding, and deep practice is noteworthy. He never seems to have gotten puffed up by his accomplishments. When he set out on pilgrimage, he said, if I meet a seven-year-old child whose understanding is greater than my own, I will learn from her. If I meet a hundred-year-old man whose understanding is less than mine, I will teach him. Given the Confucian structures of society and the respect for age and elders implicit to those structures at that time, we can see Chao Chu's uncompromising stand in truth alone, societal conventions of propriety totally gone, not even a lingering issue for him. Of course, this has nothing to do with ignoring ethics. It is deepest selfless humility. As an aside, Rose and I visited Chao Chu's monastery, Bai Lin, Cypress Grove is what it means, 
in 2006 on our China pilgrimage. There we actually saw the living descendant of the very tree in this koan. As to the oak tree or cypress tree koan, the original dialogue continues a bit further. Here's the rest of it. Zhao Chu was asked by a monk, what is the meaning of Bodhidharma's coming from India or from the West? Zhao Chu said the cypress tree in the garden. The monk said, Reverend, please do not use an object to guide me. Zhao Chu said, I am not using an object. The monk said, what is the meaning of Bodhidharma's coming from India? Zhao Chu said, the cypress tree in the garden. An object suggests that the monk saw Zhao Chu's response as implying inner and outer worlds and was either challenging him on this or expressing his refusal to buy into any such dualistic division. Aiken Roshi says, but don't suppose that the resolution of this point lies in the identity of inside and outside. That is philosophy. What is the true fact? Later, other monks heard of Zhao Chu's response and came to test him and themselves further with it. One monk asked Zhao Chu, has the oak tree Buddha nature? It's like when the monk asked uh, Zhao Chu, does even a dog have Buddha nature? Has the oak tree Buddha nature? Zhao Chu said it has. The monk said, when does the oak attain Buddhahood? Zhao Chu said, when the great universe collapses. The monk says, when does the great universe collapse? Zhao Chu said, when the oak tree attains Buddhahood. When the sky overhead rolls back. When the ground beneath your feet is gone. When the external world is instantly consumed. What remains? The sky is falling and Chicken Little is overcome with joy. Woman's commentary says, if you can see intimately into the essence of Zhao Chu's response, there is no Shakyamuni in the past and no Maitreya in the future. Maitreya, of course, is the future Buddha, the one we're all waiting for. But Wu Man says, if you can see intimately into the essence of Zhao Chu's response, there is no Shakyamuni in the past and no Maitreya in the future. And let's add, there's no oak tree either. What is there then? Wu Men underscores his point by saying, if you can see intimately, what is seeing? Intimately? What does this mean? What is the essence that is seen into? How intimate is intimately? How essential is essence? Let's not settle for mere concepts, abstractions, or thoughts about Buddhism and its so called meaning. Proximate Zen, a Zen of concepts, no matter how subtle won't solve our fundamental dilemma of how to live fully and die with dignity, dignity and peace. Mindfulness is useful, but it only gets us up to the gate. We stand there and look. We knock, but the gate won't open to where the oak tree lives. Zen takes us to the gate and then knocks it down, revealing that a gate is no gate has been so from the start. And then once we've gotten over our shock and laughter, Zen helps us set off into the undiscovered country that's always been intimately our own. Zen is an active, open-ended, ongoing project of spiritual development, or we might say a program of endlessly releasing and seeing through habitual self-centeredness. It is so endless that even the great Shakyamuni Buddha is only halfway there. There is no end to intimacy, no limit to realization. This endlessly maturing, endlessly unfolding wisdom and compassion is summed up in our own determined actualization of our great vows 
for all. The many beings are numberless. I vow to free them all. Greed, hatred, and ignorance rise endlessly. I vow to abandon them all. Dharma gates are countless. I vow to wake to them all. Buddha's way is unattainable. I vow to embody it all. Woman's verse, words do not convey the fact. Language is not an expedient. Attached to words, your life is lost. Blocked by phrases, you are bewildered. The word hot does not add heat. The words oak tree in the garden will not give shade, shelter squirrels and birds, or drop acorns on our heads. Neither are these words an expedient pointing toward something like an oak tree. Attached to even these words, our real life of seeing colors, hearing sounds, smelling flowers, seeing sunrise, enjoying the moon and stars, and intimacy with friends, all is lost. Lost in our heads, stuck with words. With me in here and you out there. We suffer in the throes of a bad dream. If only we could wake. Bodhidharma brought a new, profound, dynamic teaching of waking up, one not dependent on words or specific texts, not based on something to carry around and apply like a bandage to a wound. Rather, through direct pointing, through realization of mind itself, he helps us awake to original health, removing our canes, crutches, and bandages. How is this, the oak tree in the front yard? Blocked by phrases, by koan after koan, stuck and bewildered, may, it turns out, not be so bad. For in this way, our real life, the one we misplaced long ago, can begin. Because we are bewildered, because we know that we are bewildered, we can cross our legs, experience our breath, commit single-mindedly to a koan, to attentively counting one, two, three, attending to this very breath, and keep going until we and oak and things and no things fall away and oak tree in the front yard. This particular koan became a kind of big deal in China in Zen circles. After Chao Chu's death, Fai Yan came to Chao Chu's heir, Wei Hui Chao, Wei Chao, and asked, I heard that your late master had a saying, the oak tree in the courtyard. Is that correct? Wei Chao said, no. Fai Yan said, anyone who's been around will say that a monk asked him about the meaning of Bodhidharma's coming from the West, and that he answered, the oak tree in the courtyard. How can you maintain he didn't say it? Hui Chao said, he really didn't say it. Please don't slander him. According to Aiken Roshi, who quotes this story, this last bit may have been said with some ire, given the choice of the word slander. So what then, asked Aiken Roshi, was his meaning when he insisted, he really didn't say that. Please don't slander him. This too requires investigation and clarity. Bewilderment may be uncomfortable, but let's not try to avoid or sneak around it by pushing ourselves forward to become one with the oak. Rather, let the koan work on us like a thief in the night. Let it enter and steal away all we hold to, our acorns falling as they may. Dogen writes, when we push the self forward to become one with the 10,000 things, it is called delusion. When the 10,000 things step in and confirm the self, it is called realization or intimacy. Aiken Roshi writes, 
There's a wonderful Japanese story relating to this case that involves Shido Munon, though it is sometimes attributed to Haku and his famous grandson in the Dharma. Munon had collected a large sum of gold for the establishment of a monastery and was returning home on foot with the money. A bandit, skilled in detecting travelers carrying valuables, followed him to an inn where both put up for the night. When all was quiet, the bandit came to Munin Zenji's room and slipped open the sliding door. To his amazement, he did find a monk snoozing under his quilts, but an enormous oak tree rooted in the tatami mat, pushing its branches against the ceiling and walls. Trembling and confused, he withdrew to his own room. Next day, as the two men set out again, the bandit approached Munin and said, I am a great bandit. I know in one glance when someone has gold or jewels concerned on his person, concealed on his person, I can steal such valuables without my victim feeling a thing. But last night I met my master. I found that you had disappeared and an oak tree was growing there instead. I realize that I am your inferior. I beg you to accept me as your disciple. Munin accepted him, and the bandit went on to become a great monk. He knew true intimacy when he saw it. Regarding this case, to continue with Aitken Roshi, Kanzam, the founder of Miyoshinji, said, The koan of the oak tree has the function of a bandit. It steals everything from you. Kanzam was a marvelous Zen master who became the emperor's teacher, but left no writings at all and only this one saying is recorded of him. When Yin Wan Ingen, founder of the Obaku sect in Japan, came from China several centuries later, he visited Miyoshinji and was told this story. Prostrating himself before Kanzan's image, he said, this one saying is superior to 10,000 volumes of Teisho's. When I, says Aitken Roshi, was a young student, I visited Miyoshinji with Nakagawa Soen Roshi. We were told the story about Kanzan and Yin Wan, but it made little impression on me. Soen Roshi, however, got very excited and bowed over and over again to Kanzan's image. He took it in, and I did not. If there was ever anyone rooted, who walked like a tree. It was Soen Roshi. Blake said the fool sees not the same tree that the wise man sees. So, to make it personal and intimate, what do you make of this?